next part of the mailbag. So, this one is to from Tony Maljic. Where do you buy these? So this is referring to a rant I did in February 2017 where I was talking about MIDI patch panels and I was actually putting the MIDI patch panels together that's now in the studio. I'm assuming he's talking about the MIDI patch panels, not the Gibraltar stands, because I did cover two things in the same video. Um, but to answer the question, um, if you mean the MIDI patch bays, then I actually bought these through a company called Studio Spares who are based in London. Uh, which is www.studiospares.com. Um, they're actually made by a company in uh, Bournemouth, UK, but I've never been able to actually find the company. The company doesn't really have a website that actually, uh, or, or at the time I bought them, should I say, didn't have a website that was promoting them, so I couldn't buy them direct, so I ended up having to buy them through Studio Spares. They weren't cheap either, so I just warn you of that. Um, if you're repairing to the Gibraltar stands, now there's an interesting thing about Gibraltar stands in that I actually have bought all my Gibraltar stuff from Thormann in Germany. And the reason why I've bought everything from Thormann in Germany is very, very simple. Thormann carry the entire range of Gibraltar stands, whereas what I've found in the UK is a stockist will say it sells Gibraltar, but it doesn't actually carry the full range of Gibraltar. And as a keyboardist, you need things like um, the, uh, the, the long stand lock pieces, um, which they don't tend to carry. They tend to carry stuff for, um, for the basic setup, a basic drum kit using Gibraltar stands, but they don't carry all the ancillary bits that a keyboardist would need to make um, a Gibraltar stand work for, for them. So, um, and it's all kinds of silly little things. It's like the little rubber feet, um, that you put upside down to so that the keyboard doesn't go backwards and forwards, you know, it's, it's all that silly sort of stuff. So, yeah, Thormann in Germany is where I sourced all my Gibraltar kit. Next one from Jen Plantarda. Could you send me a copy of the floppy disk, possibly just asking? Um, this is in response to Cork T1 restoring uh, the factory sounds from disk. Um, Jen, I am more than happy to send any viewer uh, of the channel uh, copies of the discs that I hold. However, they are not going to be free. I will have to make a small charge for them, uh, purely because A, discs aren't cheap, even though I try to buy in, in a big as bulk as I can, um, and B, postage isn't cheap. So. You know, I've got to cover my costs. I'm, you know, I can't just sort of like go sending stuff out. Uh, and me paying for it all, it's uh, sorry, it's just not fair. Uh, so if you'd let me know if you still want them, um, get in touch and we can sort out how much it would cost to actually get a the sounds transferred onto a floppy disk. Because I said a few weeks back, well, quite a few weeks back, that I have solved the ability, or have now have the ability to duplicate all the cork discs. So. Um, can I uh, duplicate the disc and then get it across to you and how much that would cost? Uh, if you, alternatively, you can go on eBay. There are vendors on eBay who are selling the discs quite outright on eBay. Um, you can buy from there. But as I say, I can't do it for free because uh, there are some materials and some costs involved that I would have to pay out. But I'm quite happy to do it for anybody. And that involves the sort of the T1 libraries, anything like that. If you want a copy of that, just get in touch with me. Quite happy to duplicate it off. and We can discuss how much it's going to cost to get it to you. All right. The next one, um, James Lacey. Uh, I certainly wouldn't spray anything wet. That might be asking for real trouble. And this is in response to um, the Korg T1 refurbishment when I did some, uh, the video was actually replacing the battery, so I can't remember what it is, but I think there were some other comments around it as well. Um, James and anybody else, okay, as long as there is no power on the circuit board you are working with, you can actually p apply anything wet, okay. Now, I wouldn't per se say just you know, apply anything wet, but you can. Um, quite often, you know, if there's a lot of dust in, in a keyboard when I first get it, I will um, 
wipe it over with a damp cloth because a damp cloth will just attract the dust up off the off the the board before you actually start getting down to clean it um, i tend to use when i'm cleaning circuit boards uh, either isopropyl alcohol um, uh, especially for cleaning tracks and that sort of stuff that's the best stuff in the world for doing it faster it evaporates very quickly uh, and you need to use it with a, a cotton wool bud or what they now call them uh, but you know what i mean a cotton wool. That's really great for cleaning contacts, all that sort of stuff. Uh, if it's a general just cleaner of a circuit board, uh, I quite often use things like Windlean or Window X or Windex or whatever it's called uh, in the US because it's fast evaporating and it doesn't leave a residue on the board, which is what you don't want. Um, you want the residue to the stuff to be on the cloth that you're using. However, and I will use this however, I have been known to actually put circuit boards in a soapy bowl, bowl of water and leave them to soak. So I've, um, in, my, in my days, I've restored uh, disco lights and that sort of stuff and keyboards as well, where, you know, half a pint of beer has been chucked into the keyboard or something, or Coke. Coke's one of the worst things about this. Um, and the easiest way to neutralize that stuff is actually put it in a bowl of water, um, soapy water. The soap will uh, effectively start to lift the sticky residue off the board and the, so, and the water will neutralize the, the acidic effect of these things. Um, I wouldn't necessarily use bleach or anything like that, but I would use a, a bowl of soapy water, a big bowl of soapy water. I've, I've been known to stick circuit boards in a bowl of soapy, soapy water for a couple of days, um, then clean them off uh, with a cloth, um, probably more soapy water, and then put them in a warm place in the house for a week or so just to make sure they thoroughly dry out before I reconnect them to our parcels. Okay, so the rule of thumb is you can't do any of this stuff if you've got power on it. If you've got power on it, all bets are off. If there's no power there and it's a particularly hard um, sticky residue that you're trying to get off a board for whatever reason, then, you know, let's say you can actually put these things in uh, soapy water. Uh, it doesn't affect, to be honest, very much the, the, the components on the board. Although with a computerized board, I would probably, before you do that, remove all the removable components like the chip and the heat sink and the RAM and the, and the drives and all that sort of stuff. So it literally is the bare soldered components. But um, yeah, I've been known to do that in the past. Another one about the Korg T1. So yes, Surge uh, Brew. Hi, I have a Korg T1, lost a floppy. Can you tell me where I can download files to restore the keyboard sounds? Can you send me these files? Thank you so much. Well, Serge, I would be willing to send you the SysX files. Um, absolutely no problem with that. You just need to get in contact with me and tell me where you want them sent. Um, I will quite merrily zip them up and send them across. Uh, again, I, I did a... On, in the same batch, there is actually a, a comment about uh, disks. I'm quite happy to send you the, the thing through on Sys uh, the SysX file through on the in the original formatted floppy disk. Uh, if you want me to do that, unfortunately, there will be a charge for that because I've, I've not made the money. Um, or you can buy them off eBay because there's quite a lot of people selling the original factory sounds for the Korg T series on eBay. So whichever way you want to want to play it, I'm quite happy to play ball. And the last one for this section um, actually comes from two people and it was concerning the same video. And the video was um, a video I did where I basically went through the original M1 cards. So these are the card sets that the M1 put, they put, uh, Korg pushed out for the M1. Um, and there were 16 in total card pairs of a program card and the, and the data card. Um, and what I did was I effectively loaded each card into the machine and then played, went through the sequences just to give you an idea of what, the, what each card was all about. Now, I'll read the, I'll read the, 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 the responses and then I'll, I'll go through this, okay? I'm sorry to give this an unlike, but the reason is that you didn't set the songs correctly before playing. To get the correct setting, you can either transfer the card content to internal memory or simply adjust the point of each instrument track back to the original one on the card, not seen or I. Uh, leaving everything as it is, the sequence uses internal sounds of the expander, um, so the result is not good. Often the sounds sounds horrible. Just do that, you'll be impressed how beautiful the songs are. Um, and a guy called Ted Metzer, 
uh, said exactly the same. It sounds like you didn't have the sounds loaded into the internal program slots. The giveaway is the jumbled mess that are usually the percussion tracks. Might have to load the cards into memory for it to work right. Beware though, you lose the internal M1 sounds if you do this. Uh, so don't forget to back them up. Uh, proceed with caution. Thanks for the video. It's a very good point actually um, on the M1. And when I did the video, I just didn't think, I have to be honest, about this. In that the, when you load sequence data in from a card into the M1, it doesn't change the pointer reference. So that each track will always point to the internal track number, not the card track number, even though it's coming off the card. And I completely overlooked that when I did that video. I completely forgot about it, if I'm brutally honest. I just thought, well, this would be a quick, something quickly that I can show, show, do a video about and show you guys what the M1 is really capable of. And I forgot about it. So I'm bad. Um, and I apologize for that. And probably what I will do in the new year is I will make, I will redo that video making sure that all the sounds are copied to internal memory before I hit the go button. Uh, and then we'll see what the difference is between the two. Um, so I apologize if you thought, if you, I've had comments on there saying this is awesome, but believe you, when you have actually have them pointing the right sound, so, so, sound sources, it really is awesome. So apologies for those of you um, who uh, have written to me and said, I didn't do it, I do, put my hands up and say I didn't do it because I just didn't think about it um, and I will get something out there in the new year just to uh, address that. So that's it for this section. So this is the point in the video where I turn around to you, my viewer, and say if you enjoyed the content of this video please give it a thumbs up. The way the Google and YouTube analytic engines work is that the more likes you get against the video, the more it gets promoted by YouTube and Google, and therefore more people with the similar interest to what you have and I have get to see this content. This channel is driven by my love of music technology. That's what it's called, the Music Tech Guy for. If you've got queries, want to ask questions about themes or issues I raise on this channel, please 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 do put your comments into the uh, comment section below the video and i will try to address whatever issue it is you've raised or whatever question you've raised if it's something to do with me making future videos in terms of uh, how to do something on a particular piece of equipment i possess please feel free to say that as well i can't promise to make videos on all the requests i get but i do have a jolly good go at making most of them Around about here is the subscribe button. Again, to do with the uh, YouTube and Google analytic process, the more subscribers the channel gets, the more the channel gets promoted, and the more people get to see the content that you have obviously just watched. If you want to see my latest video, it will be in one of these two boxes on this side of the screen. Also, there is a second box there, and that video will be chosen for you by YouTube based on your YouTube preferences. I look forward to the next time that we interact, and I do mean interact because I always enjoy reading your comments back to me, but for now, bye bye.